Okay, so here we're continuing with the illustrated story of Stephen Stroh by Michael D. Vinsel. That's me. Now this is going to be chapter two, which is Blossom Time. So Blossom Time at the Orchard. At the Orchard. Warm breezes of May coaxed open the apple buds and transformed the orchards into wonderlands of white and pink. Yellow mustard flowers, dandelion and fresh green grass waved beneath the trees, but the outdoor crew would miss most of this splendid show. Ted Castro explained to the assembled crew, as Stephen had been told, that for the next two weeks the outdoor crew would be coming in at night to move beehives all, uh, around to all the different orchard blocks. Work would begin at 9 o'clock, and continue until the beehives had all been moved to where they needed to be. What an interesting thing, Stephen thought. Of course, he should have known at night the bees would all return to their hives, so at that time the hives could be moved without the bees getting left behind. He appreciated that here again was another thing he'd, uh, that he'd read in books, but now he would get to see it in real life. He felt privileged. On the first night of moving beehives, Stephen followed Brock to bring out all the equipment. There were olive green head nets and thick leather gloves and several metal things that, uh, that looked like flower sifters, but with a funnel top and hinged bellows on the side. These were smokers, Brock explained. Pieces of burlap would be lit on fire and put inside. The lever on the handle worked the bellows that f fanned the smoldering burlap and pumped out the smoke. The smoke was supposed to calm the bees down in case they became agitated. Usually things go smoothly and the bees are, mo are mostly calm anyway, Brock said, but sometimes if the truck goes over a bump too hard, which happens occasionally, they can get pretty ornery, he said. Now, each man got a head net a pair of gloves, and a smoker. Brock taught Stephen how to put it all on. Cuffs, ankles, and the base of the head net were sealed with duct tape. Sometimes bees find their way in somehow, so you got to keep a roll of duct tape in, in the truck just in case, uh, Brock explained. Anton Castro asked Stephen if he was allergic to bee stings. Stephen wasn't and asked what the likelihood of getting what was the likelihood of getting stung. Anton said usually about four or five times a night. Stephen didn't look forward to being stung by bees, but he felt that he you know, the shared danger of getting st uh, stung made the outdoor, outdoor crew a kind of special group, a kind of brotherhood. He wanted to belong to a group like that. That night, the beekeeper arrived driving a flatbed trailer truck uh, loaded with hives, you know, loaded up with hives stacked too high, tied down with ropes. The hives had, uh, the hives looked sort of like wooden file cabinets painted white. There was a little slot in front where the bees could fly in and out. The outdoor crew put on their head night, nets and gloves and taped up the leaks in their protective clothing. They worked in pairs, unloading the hives from the beekeeper's big truck and loading them onto smaller orchard flatbed trucks. Uh, Stephen worked with Anton. The hives were not particularly heavy. Anton stressed the point that it was important to handle them gently. He said that if, if they knocked the edge of the truck with the hive, the bees would wake up and fly out, and soon you'd be in a cloud of angry bees. As for the smokers, Anton said he never used them. He said they were useless at night. If the bees are woken up, they'll be angry anyway. Uh, the main point is not to wake them up in the first place. Stephen and Anton transferred all their hives to their truck uh, without waking up too many bees. Uh, there had been one or two that flew out, but that was all. They had tied the hives down with ropes Stephen used the special knot Anton had, told, had taught him. It was a monkey hitch. Uh, it was used by truck drivers to tie down heavy loads. It was a series of loops that worked to make a kind of winch 
allowing for tremendous leverage in tightening the rope. The loose end is then tied to the truck's cleat with a, ha a clove hitch, a simple loop over loop that holds it all secure. The amazing thing about a monkey hitch, Stephen appreciated, is that once you undo the clove hitch, uh, you just pull the rope and the whole thing comes undone like a slip knot. Stephen worked hard to memorize that knot, repeating it for hours at a time on his own. He even practiced tie, uh, tying it with his eyes closed. Uh, when the hives were all tied down, Anton and Stephen headed off to a block called the Herrick. Once in the truck, they peeled back the duct tape and folded and peeled back the duct tape and folded back their head nets. Anton drove the, tuck, uh, the truck and told Stephen that there were special rules regarding night work at the orchard. Uh, there was a small styrofoam co uh, cooler between them on the bench seat of the old truck. One of the requirements for this type of work is that both pilot and navigator have to drink beer, Anton said, gesturing to the cooler. Anton explained that with the likely, likely prospect of being stung by bees, alcohol has a suppressive effect on the severity of bee sting pain. Stephen could tell Anton was joking, but sharing beer with his superior, a supervisor, was something he was very happy to do. Anton and Stephen drove out to the Herrick, several miles from the packing house. The night was cool, perhaps 40 degrees. Anton said that would make their work easier as the bees aren't so active in the cold. They arrived at the block and Anton pulled slowly into the loading area off the road. The ground was sandy and still soft from the snow melt. Mud season in New Hampshire, <laughs> gotta love it, Anton said as he drove carefully through the sand onto the firmer soil of the orchard itself. Once on the grassy path between the rows of apple trees, the driving was easier. Uh, but Anton had to avoid any bumps. He drove very slowly. The truck had an underdrive under gear that allowed it to go very slowly without lugging the engine. They rolled over rocks and ridges that would have been bumps had he been driving faster. Anton pointed out to Stephen the cargo pallets placed at the edge of the path to mark the, where the, beehive, uh, the beehives would go. Uh, he stopped the truck and put on the handbrake, but left the truck idling. Uh, uh, Anton told Stephen to get out a pair of tire chocks at his feet. Uh, get out the pair of tire chocks at his feet. We don't want to have to stop and start the truck, so we chalk the wheels just to make sure. They walked back to the rear of the truck. Stephen untied the clove hitch and quietly pulled to undo the monkey hitch and coiled up the rope. They gripped the corners of the first hive, tilting it back slightly, slipping a hand underneath. They lifted, they lifted it and carried it over to the pallet. They set one corner down on the wood, then slowly, slowly set the hive, uh, hive down. The hive was in place as it should be, and no bees had stirred. They'd done it right. They took off another hive carried it a little further up the row and, and put it down the same way. They got back to the truck and Anton drove further up the row. They stopped and repeated the process. They continued deep into the night until there were no more hives on the truck. Stephen noticed that Anton had known from the beginning how many hives they needed for each block. Stephen realized that he had not thought of that before, but of course, it would be common sense. When the work was done, they drove the truck toward the loading area with its muddy soft sand. And, and with its muddy soft sand, it would be very easy to get hopelessly stuck, especially without any weight on the flatbed. So Anton gained a little speed just before the sand and then shifted up to third gear and gave it just enough gas to keep it from stalling and drove through using steadiness and momentum. A high gear at low speed means low torque. With low torque, you get better grip in mud. That's good to know when you're driving tractors, Anton said. Stephen reveled again in amazement. Of course, he, ta he taught himself. <clears throat> of course, he thought to himself, it's very sensible. 
uh, if you think about it, he realized that he'd not known that before. He'd never thought about it. Stevie, you remember those special rules for night work? Anton said as a question. You mean the beer? Anton held his hand clenched, uh, miming, holding a beer. Stephen pulled a can from the cooler for Anton. They'd unloaded all their hives without waking up one hive. Neither of them had been stung even once. When they got back to the packing house, Ted Castro came out of his office. Herrick's done. No problems, Anton said. That's good. How about you, Stephen? Any stings? Uh, 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 no stings. I like working out in the night, Stephen said. I just talked to Jesse on the radio. Ted Castro, uh, Ted Castro said, apparently he and George rolled over a bump a little too hard and woke up the bees. I expect they'll be in shortly. Stephen and Anton stuck around to see how they were. It was 3.40 3 in the morning. About 20 minutes later, George Malloway and Jesse arrived. They got out of their truck, peeling the duct tape off their glove cuffs as they walked. They had had a night of unloading. They had had a night of unloading hives in a fury of angry bees trying to find a way inside their protective clothing. George said he'd been stung 15 times, maybe more. Jesse said maybe 10 or 20 for him. He hadn't kept count. Jesse and George were covered with welts, even on their faces. Also, bees had gotten into their cuffs despite the duct tape. The two men stood shirtless and counted their stings. George had 15, Jesse 17. Brock radioed in that he and Bud were finished and were heading back. He hadn't mentioned about being stung. By the time all the men were back at the packing house, it was almost 4.30 in the morning. Ted Castro explained that there were bunk beds stacked in the building where the tractors and equipment had been stored for the winter. If any of the workers didn't want to drive home, they could take one, uh, take one out and set it up and sleep there. Stephen decided to do that. Anton showed, showed him the building and sh uh, showed him where the light switches were in the bathroom. Anton even said Stephen could take a shower if he wanted to, but that was up in the next building. There were two buildings. In the harvest season, they would be set up as, as the bunkhouses for the Jamaicans. One of the buildings had a big dining room with a big kitchen, like a rest, like at a restaurant. There were several wooden picnic tables that, uh, where the Jamaicans would eat. Uh, in the corner, there was a high shelf with a television on it. Anton took Stephen up to see the other building. He turned on the lights, which were a row of light bulbs with, with no shades on them, in sockets set in a beam that ran the length of the big room along the ceiling. The floor was concrete painted gray. The walls were boards painted white. Stephen supposed that they were painted white so as to make the most of the dim lighting. This building had a shower room in the place of the lower building's kitchen. The bunk beds were stacked against the back wall. There were many. Anton explained that in a big year, sometimes they had 40 Jamaicans come to the orchard. All the buildings at the orchard looked very old. There was the house where Ted Castro lived and where he had raised Anton and his brothers, a regular wooden clapboard house, white with dark green trim, so common in New Hampshire. It must have been, uh, it must have been more than a hundred years old, but was well kept. It was kept up well, Stephen thought. Beside the house, opposite the bunk houses, was the packing house, on the edge of which was the business office where Stephen had first met Ted Castro. Anton, how old is this place? I mean, the orchard here, in the building, Stephen asked. Gosh, I never really thought about it, but it's pretty old. You see these bunk houses? They were built during World War II. The government paid to have them built to have German prisoners of war stay here. German prisoners picked apples back then. Of course, I wasn't even born back then, and I born then, but my dad told me that, Anton said. Stephen was astonished. German prisoners of war stayed here? Stephen didn't say anything about it, but he wondered why it was that sometimes people say things that are profoundly significant, but they say them, in so, they say them so nonchalantly. 
Surely Anton understand that the fact that German POWs stayed at these bunkhouses is very interesting, Stephen thought. Stephen liked Anton. Stephen remembered a book he had read in junior, uh, uh, read in junior high school, The Summer of My German Soldier by Betty Green. Uh, that, in that story, a Jewish girl meets a German prisoner of war who had escaped from a POW camp in Arkansas. His name in the story was Anton. <laughs> Stephen had liked that book. That night, Stephen set up a, a bed and slept in the building where the Jamaicans would sleep, where German POWs once slept. Anton left and Stephen was alone in the bunkhouse. There was a panel of switches for the lights. Stephen left one of the bulbs at the far end of the room on. He set up a bed, laid down, and thought about the place where he was. It wasn't far from his home, from the house where he'd grown up, but he'd never known that in just the neighboring town there was a place that had accommodated prisoners of uh, prisoners from World War II. It occurred to Stephen that the summer of my German soldier could have just as easily taken place in New Hampshire as Arkansas. Then he got up, turned on more lights, and looked carefully at the beds. He could see the frames were a lattice work of steel slats held in place by steel rings hooked to little holes in an angle iron frame. They looked like military bunk beds might look, and they looked very old. Stephen couldn't know for sure, but he thought it was possible that these were the very, uh, the very beds that had been provided by the government for the German prisoners. He couldn't know it, but he was right. He turned out the lights and lay down and go to uh, and lay down to sleep. He remembered back to the trout pond. The trout pond was hardly a pond at all. It was just half a mile up uh, or so up Route 101 from Franklin's pond. It was a pool in a small stream. The stream ran through the woods and crossed Route 101 through a concrete pipe under the road. The stream was only about three or four feet wide and was only a few inches deep as it ran through the pipe and emptied into the pool. That pool, about 12 feet across, was the trout pond. It wasn't stocked with trout. Its brook trout were native. The fish were so wary that if you simply walked up to that pool and started fishing, you'd never see or catch any. As soon as the fish detected even the shadow of a fishing pole, they would dart away so fast that most people would not even suspect there were trout in there at all. Stephen remembered trying to call, crawl uh, stealthily through the clumps of speckled alder that mostly hid the pool, and even then spooking the fish. Just when he could make out the shadows of the trout on the stony bottom, he saw the shadows dart away, and he knew that day he would not catch any trout. In fact, most people were unaware that there was even a stream there at all. It was marked by three metal stakes with little reflectors on the edge of the road. But the stream and the trout were there all right, and the stream and the trout were there all right, and some of the trout got to be reasonable size, like eight inches or so. Or so. One day, when he must have been around eight or nine years old, he and Matthew had collected six or seven grasshoppers for bait. That day, they crept through the concrete pipe from the other side of the road. They were both small enough that they could do that easily. They just, they just stepped along the sides of the pipe, straddling the stream. As they approached the end of the pipe, they stopped and looked at the pool for a while. It was sunny outside, but dark and creepy inside the concrete pipe. They could see the shadows of several trout hovering along the bottom. It took some time to train their eyes to recognize the trout themselves. Then... They could see that a few of them were quite big. The trout had not detected the two boys in the pipe. Matthew had a real fishing rod, a fly rod, rigged with just a size 12 dry fly hook on a thin leader. On this, he impaled a live grasshopper. He dropped the struggling insect into the water below him. He didn't cast. He just let the grasshopper float down, on, down to the end of the pipe over the little waterfall onto the surface of the pool. 
It floated toward the trout, and as quick as the blink of an eye, a trout came up from the bottom and snatched the grasshopper. At that, at that, Matthew whispered, Mississippi, and twitched his rod to set the hook. He explained that that is the perfect amount of time to wait to set the hook. The trout struggled against the line. Matthew crept toward the end of the pipe so he could raise his rod high enough to retrieve the fish. For some 30 seconds, the trout fought, Matthew leading it in circles with his rod tip until it began. Just a second here. This is a picture of that, of the inside the pipe, and that's the trout pond. And Stephen would be the one in the checkered shirt. Okay, that's right. Okay, so for some 30 seconds, the trout fought, Matthew leading it in circles with his rod tip until it began to tire. Matthew raised his rod, a rod tip to bring the fish to hand, put his thumb into the mouth of the trout. The tongue has teeth on it that make it, uh, make it possible to grip the otherwise slippery fish. The trout vibrated with energy. Matthew had brought a, a cloth bag to put it in. The cloth bag was handy because he could keep it in the stream under, the, under their legs and hold it down with a rock and the fish would stay alive. The bag had a straw, had a drawstring that could be pulled pulled shut. After that, it was Stephen's turn. Of course, the rest of the fish had been spooked by the commotion of catching the one fish. So Stephen and Matthew waited for a while. Uh, waited a while for the fish to settle down. Stephen didn't have a real fishing pole. He had a whippy piece of maple sapling about six feet long, with a piece of line the same length, tied to that. With the, with the clinch knot that Matthew had taught him was a bare dry fly hook, just as Matthew had. Stephen took a grasshopper out of the jar, held the insect, insect carefully by its backward knees, and pierced the abdomen, pushing the tiny point of the hook up to, the, up to just below the thorax, just as Matthew had done. He dropped the gra his grasshopper to float down into the pool on the current. Sure enough, just as quickly, the grasshopper disappeared in a swirl. Stephen said, Mississippi, and set the hook with a, gent with a little tug. He felt the pulsing struggle of the fish. It was an interesting feeling, like electricity. He noticed that he could tell the difference between ty different types of fish by the rhythm of their fight. He'd caught perch and sunfish before, but never a trout. With his shorter pole, it was easier for him to bring, his, bring in his fish. He was able to bring it in close, grasp it with his thumb in, the, in its mouth, index finger on its chin, just as Matthew had done. He held it carefully and removed the hook. He knew to hold his thumb and forefinger in a ring around its body, behind, just behind the head, so it could not squirm free. Stephen didn't want to lose his first trout that way. The trout did not have a spiny dorsal fin as yellow perch did. Stephen remembered the worst was catfish, the brown bullhead. They have sharp spines in their dorsal fins and their pectoral fins, spines that can sting. Matthew had shown Stephen how to grasp cat, catfish by the belly with one pectoral fin spine held safely between his forefinger and middle finger. That way, the fish couldn't squirm away and could not sting either. With the trout, Stephen only had to worry about the fish escaping. He held the beautiful fish triumphantly. It was marvelous, marvelously beautiful. Stephen wanted never to forget this day, the day he caught his first trout. He knew he wouldn't. Matthew told Stephen that that trout was all they should catch out of that place for a while. He explained that those big ones probably didn't get that big in the trout pond itself. They had probably migrated up from the beaver pond downstream. But either way, they didn't want to fish it out. That was Stephen's first trout. Since they were leaving, it didn't matter if they spooked the trout, so instead of going back through the scary pipe as they come, they just went out the easy way. You know, along the edge of the pool and then up to the embank up the embankment to Route 101. Okay, so here's the picture of Stephen's first brook trout. So on the walk home, 
Stephen opened up the opened the cl damp cloth bag and looked at the two brook trout for a long time. One was around eight inches long, the other a little smaller. They were beautiful, like amazing jewels. Stephen wondered how such fantastic coloration could also be such good camouflage. He'd seen how difficult it had been to see them. But he noticed that the top of the fish was olive green with dar a little dark curly lines. That would make good camouflage. But, but the sides were br brilliantly colored. The dull green of the top gave, uh, gave way to a, copper, uh, to a copper background with yellow spots and several beautiful red spots surrounded by a blue halo. The copper color deepened to bright red close to the belly, especially up front. Behind all this were faint bluish oval shapes along the sides. The, he knew these were called par marks. He'd read that in younger trout these marks were obvious, but they would fade as the fish grew. In big trout, they are not there at all, as he'd seen in magazine pictures. The pectoral and pelvic front, uh, fins were mostly, mostly brilliant red, darkening to black toward the front with white leading edges. Stephen wondered why no sports team that he knew had adopted this beautiful motif for their uniforms. It was around that time that Stephen had started to carry a wallet. His father had given him the wallet and said he must always keep it with him when he left the house. It didn't matter if he had no money. The point was that carrying a wallet was what you know, carrying a wallet was part of what it meant to be a man. Stephen kept a hockey trading card of Bobby Orr in his wallet. Uh, after that day fishing at the trout pond, he made a small paper envelope. In it, he put several size 12 dry fly hooks and several coiled lengths of fishing line, each about 10 feet long, all held neatly coiled with a piece of masking tape. He would keep this envelope in his wallet, and he promised himself that he would always keep fish hooks and line in his wallet. That way, wherever he went, he'd be able to find some way to fish. Lying in the iron bed at the apple orchard, bunk, at the apple orchard bunkhouse, Stephen noticed the gray twilight of morning through the windows. He knew he, he should sleep, but couldn't. He remembered that when he had been a little older, maybe 12 or 13, he'd learned the school bus routes, and sometimes after school, he'd taken a school bus to go fishing instead of to go home. He would get off the bus as close to the fishing spot as he could, then go into the woods, choose a sapling, and whittle it down with his pocket knife. He cut off any branches, rig it up with the line and with line and hook, and then find an insect for bait. The best bait was caddisfly larvae. Those are little bugs whose larval stage is aquatic. They cement little bundles of sticks or small pebbles around themselves to protect their fragile bodies, and perhaps also for camouflage. They clung to underwater rocks. In the current, you had to feel around for them, as you couldn't see well through the swirling water. He remembered the, t the tingly feeling of the cold water on his arm. Lying there in the bunkhouse at the orchard, Stephen re even remembered once while camping with his friends Daryl and Larry McBain uh, at Ferry's bathtub. He'd fished in the stream at night. He'd fished in the stream at night. He'd been there many times and knew the stream well, and so tried fishing with his eyes closed. He felt the rocks and reached down to feel for a caddis. He found one, peeled off its coat of twigs, pulled his hook from where, where he'd stuck it in the base of the sapling pole, uh, and in the darkness impaled the unfortunate larva. Working by the sound of the water, he gently swung out the bait and let it drift, mindful not to allow slack. He felt the distinct nibble of a trout, whispered Mississippi, and set the hook. He knew it was a stocked brook trout by the tempo of its fight, not as electric as the little native trout. He remembered he'd cheated, opening his eyes to bring the flopping slippery fish to hand, but anyway, it was night. 
he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't want to catch his uh, catch his thumb on the hook in the fish's mouth. He realized, lying on the metal bunkhouse bed so many years later, that he still kept hooks and line in his wallet. He rolled over on his side and covered his eyes against the morning light and whispered, I can catch a trout with my eyes closed, and slept. That's the end of chapter two.